today's episode, I speak to Sam Warner about autistic people in the corporate workplace. Sam talks about her experiences and how companies can make it easier for autistic people to thrive. We discuss whether an autistic person should disclose their autism at the interview stage and what reasonable adjustments can be made. On the flip side, there are many benefits to having an autistic brain and an autistic person should share these with their future or current employer. This is an interesting conversation around autism in the workplace and a realisation that good maverick leadership enables all employees to thrive. Listen up to the rest of the conversation. Before we begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the Pathologically Curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast, on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today, our guest is Sam Warner. Hi, Sam. Hello. How are you doing? I'm groovy, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I expect you to be dancing when you say that you're groovy. <laughs> There's a lot of dancing in my house, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is brilliant. Um, before we get into, into our conversation, tell us about you. Wow, that's a massive question, especially for someone who's autistic. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll narrow it down by letting you know that I'm 47. I live in Telford in Shropshire. I'm married to David. We have no children and we usually have cats, but not at the moment. I used to work for corporate. Oh, yes. Until I saw the error of my ways. <laughs> And how was that? As you said, you mentioned that you're autistic um, mm. and I, I do a lot of leadership training and I ensure that I train um, leaders to understand how to work with autistic people. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious how you found working in a corporate whilst being autistic. Well, to start with, I didn't know I was autistic, so uh-huh. I didn't know that it was really difficult um, in a way that wasn't difficult for other people because I don't know what it's like inside other people's heads who does but I didn't fully appreciate the effort that I was having to spend um, masking is the correct term yeah uh, where I'm pretending to be like everyone else I'm conforming I'm double checking what I'm going to say before I say it I'm selectively going through almost like flow diagrams in my head to assess whether this is the appropriate response to this scenario rather than just being myself and so I I did find corporate exhausting but I didn't know why because I didn't know I was autistic until I was 35 I'm, like I say I'm 47 now so um it was a, a an aha moment when I I figured it out and it, it made a lot more sense because I was like, oh, that's why I like working with blokes. Because <laughs> they oh, say yeah. what they mean and mean what they say. Ah. That's what they say. They do say that autistic females are more like neurotypical males. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, uh, yeah, a bit like that, especially in terms of language. Mm. Um, um, and, and quite often we get labelled as a gender if we're too direct and there's not enough sort of fluff around the edges or small talk that we're ball breakers and um you know we're, we're bitches and you know and we're, we're climbing over everyone's dead bodies to get to the top well actually would you say that about a guy probably not yeah exactly what led you to finding out did you get a diagnosis at 35 or did you just 
decide that you were because you've read some stuff? I mean, what happened? So I, uh, it started with doing an online thing, right? We did an online thing, all of us at work. And uh, I was working at an IT firm at the time and I scored highest, even above all the autistic guys that were there. (laughs) Ah, okay, there's something in this. And uh, uh, I was encouraged to go to my doctor to see if I could seek a, a formal diagnosis. Uh, which I did. And uh, when I went to the doctor, uh, you can't argue with logic, you know. Mm. So I'm married. I'm fully functioning in society. I own my own home. I drive a car. I've worked since I came out of uni. And uh, there are no perceivable benefits for me to get a formal diagnosis because I don't require accommodations in a in a job or whatever in her eyes um and I was like but I I need to know not because I'm searching for a label but because actually Mm. I I want to be reassured that I'm not just imagining this and I'm not sort of wishing that I'm autistic because everything's so hard so I was unable to persuade her um and I was unable to persuade another doctor uh, because I would have opinion obviously and so I thought, right, okay, well, let's let's figure this out. And I spoke to multiple people who do, I would call, informal diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So they are very experienced. They've seen hundreds and hundreds of people who are all seeking a diagnosis. So they'll, they'll do like a review with them to figure out what kind of language they might want to use when they go and see the doctor. And it became apparent to all of them there wasn't one person that said oh no you're not autistic or you're borderline it was always oh yeah yeah, definitely (laughs) um so to have that endorsement from people who who see autistic people all the time was actually a much bigger yes for me Mm. than going to a psychiatrist who probably only covered autism in a couple of weeks when they went and did their degree or they only see it in children yeah yeah how can you possibly measure me against a, a, a male child (laughs) <laughs> I know it's good to see though that autism diagnosis that they're, they're actually broadening it out and factoring females now and recognizing that the, the girls will display differently to the guys which is which is really good so you say um the GP said that you didn't need any accommodations would you have said that you needed accommodations well certainly at that point I had to agree with the GP because um there was a bit of ego a bit of pride about I don't need any special things I'm fine thank you very much you know there's nothing wrong with me I'm not broken but there was also an element of I had spent so long uh accommodating for myself yeah that I didn't understand that um accommodations could be made for me to help me and uh so, so that I didn't have to struggle all the time I didn't know what those accommodations could be Yes. Yeah. So how, it's like I, I don't know what I don't know. So how can I ask for something if I don't know it, if it even exists? <laughs> no, no. It makes it makes a lot of sense, and the accommodations quite often aren't much. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think I think there's I think when it comes to neurodiversity, there's a big concern as to how would that work within an organisation. So I think yeah. sometimes people have a view of autism like Rain Man or The Good Doctor or something like that. So they either have this highly functioning savant intelligence, mm. but everything else is falling apart, or they have somebody really severe. It, it's almost as if in layman terms, there's no normality in autism. Would that be fair to say? Um Mm, that's a really tricky one the word normal is very well for me what the <laughs> heck is normal I, I think the difficulty is that particularly on film and in tv series we often get to see a stereotypical portrayal of mm. someone with autism mm-hmm. so they're usually um either rain man where um you know savant where the, he'll always be in care he'll never yeah. be able to hold down a job he'll never have a romantic relationship Um, and quite often people who are needing care have other comorbidities so that means you know that they've got other things going on for them which makes life even harder you know it might be that they've got Tourette's or Down syndrome or something else Um, so it's like layer upon layer of 
challenge for them. Or then you've got um, portrayals of the sort of superpower thing, the expert genius, like mm. the good doctor or Bones or Sherlock Holmes. Mm-hmm. And, and you think, well, that, that's lovely to watch. And, and I do enjoy watching those programmes very much. But <laughs> <laughs> if that's what people think autism looks like in all autistic people, then that's not helpful. No. So what is helpful? I mean, I know that organisations often think it's quite difficult if somebody... Um, it's diffi- I think it's difficult for somebody who's a candidate because they're not sure whether they should disclose their autism at interview or not. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when people have disclosed their autism, they haven't got the job, but they don't know if that's because they disclosed it or mm. not. Um, and if they're in an organisation and people then find out, then there's this concern about how will you work with an autistic person and what should you do? So... Mm-hmm. What do you think? I mean, is it hard to employ an autistic person? Um, yeah, so, so so taking that interview scenario, to disclose or not to disclose, Yeah, uh, I would suggest that before disclosing for themselves, <coughs> excuse me, they should ask about the inclusion and diversity pol- policy that they have. So it's, it's not unreasonable to ask an organisation could you tell me a bit about your inclusion and diversity program? What things have you put in place? What training is there for your employees? I'm really very interested in this subject and I'd love to know because they'll always ask you what questions have you got in your interview? Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good one. And then you'll really get a flavour of where they are in mm. their inclusion and diversity. Is it, well, we all do a computer-based training program that takes 20 minutes and you've got to pass the 70% test and you're done, which a lot of organizations do tick um or is it actually that they are actively encouraging diversity into their teams because they know the massive benefits that it brings and they're actually really at the front of the curve so that's a really great way to gauge whether it's a safe space to reveal that you're autistic um and and also just I don't know, there's a feeling in the room sometimes if you're getting on with someone well and they seem very approachable Um, that might be someone who's quite open-minded and easy to talk to so you might feel comfortable in sharing that with them and I would I would go ahead and tell them all the benefits that you enjoy by having a different brain if you're going to do that go straight in there with do you know what I have to share with you I am so lucky I have an autistic brain because I can do I don't know hyper focus I can um what can I do gosh there's so many things I can do I I, am an ideas (laughs) generator I'm a machine when people need ideas it just comes out of me whether whether you need the hundred ideas it might be just two work but if you didn't have the hundred you wouldn't find the two I'm a great problem solver I can see things from sort of helicopter view but I can come down into the detail if I need to and then come back up to helicopter view I can I can I can notice things in the room that other people don't notice. And that might be facial expressions. It might be a new, a nuance or a tone because I've trained myself to look for that stuff. And, and those kind of extra attributes you might not have in your team already, but I can bring those to your team, all of those things. And it might be that I need a couple of accommodations just in balance because, you know, we can't all be superheroes, make light of it. Make it sound like you're not a problem. You're not bringing pain to them. You're actually bringing benefit to them. And and, and say things, you know, that, that you do need. So actually, if I was going to go back and work for somebody in an organisation, I would say I really need peace and quiet from time to time in order to completely focus on my work and do a fantastic job. It makes me super productive if I can just shut off the outside world. So if it's an open plan office, I'd really appreciate if if I could be by a wall or in a corner, away from a door and uh, away from the drinks machine or the photocopier where there's lots of people coming up all the time. So a quiet spot in the office would be fantastic because I appreciate you can't give me an office of my own necessarily. Um, But also from time to time, I might need to put my headphones on so that I can cut out the the phones going off, the chatter, that someone's brought their baby in, there's somebody clicking a pen, um, that you know, all sorts of things going on that are constantly interrupting my concentration. And, and when you start listing those things, they go, oh, yeah, actually, I hate that about the office too. I totally get that. 
because most people don't like all those things it's not just autistic people yeah it's really interesting I did some work I think it must be a couple of years ago in an organization and I understand the hot desking principle and open planning because you know who hasn't done that in the years but what was quite different about this particular place is that they had decided that every single person would be hot desking and there'd be no so rather than having some hot desks it was like everyone's hot desking so you walk so nobody had their own place to personalize if you I mean I think one advantage I suppose it meant that everybody came to work early because they could choose their favorite desks so you know so everybody ended up working longer hours because they had to get a desk but there was the noise in the area was unbelievable it was absolutely impossible to concentrate and I'm a person I'm an extrovert I'm the person that likes noise to concentrate but you couldn't hear it because you'd have people talking people doing Skype calls without headsets <laughs> it was just it was just mental and it was just like it's absolutely impossible to do any work at all like you, because even if you was having a phone call you couldn't hear what that person was saying on the phone because somebody else is shouting over the noise because they've not got a headset on to talk to someone this you know on a video call and I just thought I just think you know it's not just autistic people couldn't cope, but it was just such a weird idea because productivity went down so significantly. It was because I because I was in there to do some work for a small period of time, and I went there before they moved desks. So I went there where it was an office environment, normal normal office environment. You knew everybody where everybody it was to mm-hmm. this uh, free for all. And if you're new and you have to ask questions, because I was a consultant or something, I couldn't remember who anybody was and I couldn't use where they sat as a clue so I was going and it wasn't and it meant that people weren't even in the same department so you could ask somebody a question they're like I don't work in that department <laughs> and you're like oh okay <laughs> so then you that, and weird. you mentioned something really important there so because I have dysgraphia I find it very difficult to remember people's faces right over and over so I have to meet someone about 10 times before I've really nailed in that person's face with their name and perhaps where they work it has to happen many times it doesn't just happen over once or twice you know other people will have experienced it you see someone in the supermarket and they go hi Jude how are you doing and you're desperately going oh gosh who are you and where are you from <laughs> you're in the wrong place exactly. because you meet them somewhere else normally and then and this time the they've got a hat on or something and you're like yeah. don't know you with a hat exactly <laughs> or they're a police officer and they're in civvies and you just your brain just can't connect and make that you know that oh who are they well that's what it's like for me pretty much all the time with people so I have to I have to quite often apologize and say please forgive me if we've met before (laughs) um I'm not fantastic with faces uh but if you tell me your name I'll know if we've met before um and normally you know as long as you're smiling when you say stuff like that people are okay with it Um, But certainly in terms of of recognising people, because people don't wear name badges like they used to anymore. They might wear wear a lanyard, but quite often you can't even see it. You can't see it, it, because people do put it so that you can't see it, because nobody likes their pictures being shown, do they? No, or in their pocket or clipped on. And you don't want to be looking down at the end of the tie to be able to see what the name was. Oh, Um, absolutely. Yeah, it's really unhelpful. What advice uh, advice um, would you give to a HR team or... Um, a leader in an organisation on they've just been told they've got an autistic member of staff um, how what would you what would you say to them to make that easier for the autistic person and the organisation so in order for them to be told that there's an autistic person in the team I would have to make a leap and say that that person is self-aware and knows they're autistic because, of course, there's also the other side where you've got someone who you think, yeah, this person's really autistic, but they don't know it. So yes. how can you help them? So that's a kind of slightly different story. But happens all the time. Yes. And I usually end up having to go in to help. And that's fine. That's what I'm here for. And uh, but, but when someone has revealed I'm autistic and um, I, I might need some accommodations, it's really, really helpful for the autistic person to be clear about what they struggle with and what they need so that the other person the team leader or whomever can be clear about what's within their power to meet 
them on those accommodations. So I might say I need an office completely on my own with a door I can shut. Well, you know, that's probably... it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the compromise is, OK, could I be sat in the corner of a room in a desk that's always mine? Because actually change really, really skyrockets my anxiety. Yeah. Um, and if I was to think that I've, I've been made late by traffic coming into work and now I have to sit in the middle or by the door or by the drinks machine or whatever, I may as well just go home. Yes, yes. I always want to come to work, isn't it? Yeah. And maybe there's something about if the accommodation side of things at the office can't be changed for some reason, is there a way to meet that person halfway in terms of letting them work from home for a couple of days a week? If they don't have to be in meetings constantly in person, then there's definitely benefit from allowing them to create a safe space for themselves where they can be super productive. Mm -hmm. Because that's all we want from our employees, don't we? We want them to be happy and productive and not be absent. Exactly. So So why would you create that environment? (laughs) I'd imagine that for some autistic people, this whole working from home thing has presented a whole new set of problems. Um, and opportunities. Yeah. yeah. So, so businesses will have realised that the old myth of working from home is people watching Netflix all day and occasionally answering their phone is actually one in a thousand people do that. And you mm-hmm. need to deal with that individual, just that individual. Um, but what tends to happen in an organisation is you get someone who does that And then they whitewash everybody with the same rules, right? No one can work from home. Why? Just because this one person who can't play the rules, deal with that person instead. We're working fine. Um, And what they've realised, now they've been forced to allow people to work from home, is that people are really productive. They probably work longer hours actually working than they did when they were in the office because occasionally you're getting up to get a drink, you're chatting, you're sitting in meetings all the time. Meetings tend to be shorter now, they're on Zoom. People just want to get it done and get off because they're sick of Zoom. And uh, yeah, people are kind of, they've, they've took back charge of the time in their day. And, and I've been encouraging organisations to say to their staff, try to leave whole afternoons where everybody has no meetings. Mm. so that if you've got a project or or horrible spreadsheet stuff or whatever something that really needs your 100 percent attention you know you're not going to get interrupted that that's that would that's just golden because you just don't normally get that but when you do that people become super productive deadlines are met people take on extra work because now they've been able to get their day-to-day stuff out the way um, so many people are 100% committed on things and then they're expected to do extra stuff as part of their job, like admin or oh. training or all that sort of stuff. Well, if you don't give them some bandwidth to do those things, then they'll never get done. Okay. So if you're in a scenario where you've got someone who's autistic who has been working very well in the office, um, maybe because they've had some additional support or there's a routine that they understand and they're now working from home mm-hmm. um, and they're struggling because, say, they've got a bit of a tech addiction going mm-hmm. on or they, or the routine is different and there's no one to, or no one has supported setting up a new routine. Yeah. What, what would you suggest? Because I, I know that, because I know that neurotypical people have severely struggled from that. Because every, everybody has a routine, don't they? They have the, I go to work routine. You know, I get my cup of coffee, I stop off at here, I go on there. And then that's gone. And that has caused a lot of issues for neurotypical people. Um, and I'm just wondering how that would affect, say, I know all autistic people are different, but an autistic person who really is routine driven, who needs to be told, for example, you know, you put your phone down, <laughs> stop doing this, you know, but they don't have that oversight because they're on their own at home maybe, or they're in, a, or they're working from home and so is the rest of the family. So maybe the, the quiet that used to exist in the office doesn't exist at home now because there's a dog running around and there's, I don't know, children yeah. or parents or somebody else working, or maybe they can't even get on a PC. 
Absolutely, yeah. So there, there are challenges. I, I, I won't just whitewash it with it's a great opportunity because <laughs> <laughs> it is. But we also know there's challenges. Yeah, there are there are definitely challenges, and and it's about finding um, a way to to bring a new routine in, mm. and that's for everybody, not just for autistic mm. people. And not all autistic people love routine. Some people are feel like they're in prison when there's a routine. Um, yeah. I'm not a big fan of routine. I actually really like to mix it up. Uh, I, I plan things, but I like to leave, I don't know, the mornings and the evenings looser uh, yeah. so I can move things around depending on my sleep pattern because I have ADHD, so my sleep's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, sometimes I get four hours, sometimes I get 10, sometimes I don't get any. and um, That's just the way I'm wired. And I just have to be able to adapt my day depending on how the, the, the night's gone. So, uh, so a routine for me would be a nightmare. And actually working nine to five was very, very difficult because sometimes I'd be turning up to work having had two or three hours sleep, really not at my best. Mm. Whereas I could have been doing um, some sleep in the morning and then turning up at lunchtime and then working my eight hours. So um, find, finding that routine, if you can't find your own routine, it, there's, there's an element of that self-advocacy about reaching out and saying, do you know what? I could really do with some help here. Because unless... I mean, if you're not missing deadlines and you're being productive and you're doing the work you're doing, if you're on your phone all day as well, well, that's fine. Who cares? Who cares if you've got Netflix on in the background, if you're delivering all of your deliverables on time and to a high quality? Yeah, I suppose it's it's that. That's the um, the concern would be, wouldn't it? Whether so, so people on their output, not on their bums on seats. Yeah. I've always said that, that I could get my all of my work done in four hours of an eight hour day and I'm not required to perhaps bring work forward. So it might be that actually my working day at home is four hours and then the other four hours I just make sure I'm available by email and phone. Yeah. And that should I've, be all right. I've always said that if you if you're leading and you lead that accommodate, say, someone who is autistic whether mm-hmm. you have autistic people or not, <laughs> then you actually will be leading quite well because the the things that make an autistic person's life easier are the sort of things that you should do anyway. Yes. Yes, um, absolutely, Jude. You've hit the nail on the head. There's no losers here. No. I, you it, know, no. The, the inner child comes out sometimes in teams where they think, oh, you're special. You need special accommodations. You know, how come you get to start at half past 10 every morning because you're not a morning person? I want to start at half past 10. OK, so have you asked for that? No. OK, ask for it then. Tell them why you need to start at half past 10. And don't forget that means you're not going home till eight o'clock. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's no different from... <laughs> Years ago, when I was uh, in HR working in London, and there was this heavily pregnant lady who had had issues in the past with, you know, miscarriages and things, and she was really nervous coming to work. And I just said, "Don't come in the rush hours. So Mm. come after rush hour and leave after rush hour." And everybody was like really shocked, and they were like, "That's so unfair." And I was like, "Why?" (laughs) <laughs> because it wasn't it wasn't like her work wasn't customer facing in the sense that she had to be there at particular hours you just had to do the work yeah and it was just considered so like scandalous back in whenever it was a long time ago and it was just like to me it sounds like common sense because the alternative is that she signed off sick for the next six you yeah. know next so many months so you might as well just do it <laughs> and it's still happening um, you know, uh, from time to time, I've done a bit of temping because it suits me to dip my toe back into the corporate pond, um, keep in touch with the people I'm helping. So I might do a couple of weeks temping here or there. And it's systemic. It's still going on. That, that sort of schoolyard, um, oh, it's not fair kind of mentality. Um, I, I, and we just need to lose it. We just need to. And part of the problem is that managers that come in are trained by previous managers so they're perpetuating bad habits yeah it needs some maverick leadership i think yes to, to look in fresh and say how would you do it <laughs> like that <laughs> exactly so tell me what are the benefits of having an autistic person on the team oh well so every autistic person is different, different just like every neurotypical person is different and they have talents and they have um 
abilities even that that uh, are are precious to them because uh, the, they only know what's in their head and mm-hmm. and sometimes it's hard for them to articulate it but sometimes if you observe you can see the ge- genius I'm going to use that word genius in them or the talent in them um but but what they really bring is that very special different angled view so where you've got a team where they've always done what they've always done in the same way and they keep getting the same results and there's no real change it's all very ploddy perhaps they're having trouble solving some problems um most autistic people are fantastic at problem solving for other people Mm -hmm. and uh, they will come up with lots of ideas they'll come in at a different angle they'll ask quite blunt questions at times which again a lot of neurotypical people won't because they think it's rude when actually sometimes you just need to ask a blunt question it's like the elephant in the room so why don't we just do it like this oh oh right okay uh oh yeah you're not wrong actually (laughs) and someone has an aha moment uh also that that ability to hyper focus so if someone gives me a project that requires my full attention and they need it quickly I could work all night on that project if if I wanted to, to deliver it. Um, You might say, oh, well, I don't want you to work all night on it. But actually, if you get a really high quality product at the end and you can give me a day off in lieu afterwards, we're golden. So, uh, and and the project might be better quality because I did it all in one go because I was in flow, like an artist might be in flow, um, than if I was to do it in chunks and have to keep picking it up and scratch your head and going where was I yeah which is always irritating yeah exactly um and, and also I, I think autistic people bring a freshness of language so um whether they're aware or not aware of their autism um most people who are autistic ask questions and in my experience in corporate that's 20 plus years a lot of other people don't ask questions they seem to just accept woolly instructions um, and, and and then and then the, once the person's gone, they'll go. So, do you think they mean this, or do you mean? I've Ask never them. understood why people. I, you know, in fact, I've just done a coaching session actually, and I said, rather than worrying about whether they think this or that, why don't you just ask? <laughs> you know, um, because to me, as a maverick leader, that seems to make the most sense because it's less effort. If I'm oh, not totally. sure. I'll people are worried them. about, um, you know, what people will think of them. Or if I ask that question, they'll think I don't know stuff and that I'm yeah. not up to the job. But you don't when know I... stuff. That's why you need to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> so it's exactly. kind of fair. It's a fair comment, really. So do you think about it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I was a leader, I'd rather have somebody in my team asking me questions to clarify. And in fact, as a leader, when I'm giving somebody an instruction for a task I want them to do, what I will tend to do is say, and now could you just, tell me back what you think you're going to do in this task it'd be really useful for me to know whether I've used the right language so you give them permission to tell you back it's a bit like you know when you learn something if you can teach someone else you know you've really got it yeah exactly so if you allow them that space and time to say back to you what they heard you say that's when you can pick out the points that perhaps didn't land and you can say oh no I didn't mean that I meant this oh right okay yeah now I've got it so what I think one of the benefits um, about autistic people in the workplace is that they don't succumb to groupthink because they're really comfortable saying, well, they're really comfortable thinking this makes no sense. Um, but whether they express it or not will depend on the environment that they're in. So they might have high anxiety, so will not express that. Mm. But if they're, which would be a complete loss to the organisation. So that's why I go back to saying, you know, if you run it as if you had an autistic person, mm-hmm. then you, you're better off because you would have people who are comfortable saying, nah, emperor's naked. Pretty sure, nah, <laughs> not, not even underwear, definitely <laughs> naked, you know. Um, and I think everybody benefits from that. Definitely, definitely. So, so um, a big thing that I work on with people is ego. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and certainly... I know we're generalizing a lot in some of the things that we're saying, but in my experience of working with autistic people, they have a lack of ego. 
Yes. And, and a lot of people will think, oh, they're really selfish. Actually, they're all ego. And I'm like, no, 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 they're not. They're not selfish. They're trying to survive. Big difference. I always say survive, self interest. They're not selfish. They're self interested. And I think there's a big difference between that. Absolutely. Um, and again, most autistic people I know are altruistic. They're mm-hmm. always looking for how they can help other people um, for nothing in, re- in return. And, you know, they're quite often they're animal lovers. They're very kind. They want the best. They, they're very hippie-ish, actually, in outlook. They want <laughs> groovy. To be, yeah, groovy. They want everyone to love each other and be peaceful and no wars and no. Yes, actually, it's, like, it's a purity in humanity in a way, isn't it? Yeah, we don't want conflict. We don't want confrontation. Those things are horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're great peacemakers. It's very unusual to get an autistic person who's aggressive uh, because they want war, you know, yes. of any kind, even yes. a language war. Um, if they appear to be aggressive, it's usually because they're actually angry and they're or frustrated anxious. and yeah. they don't know how to express it because none of us are taught how to express those emotions in a healthy way, whether we're autistic or not. <laughs> so it really <laughs> goes back to just good leadership so having an autistic person in your team is no more difficult than having a maverick in your team or uh, a genius in your team or anything that is different from quote unquote normal you know because I suppose in the same way you would if you had somebody who was in a wheelchair Mm-hmm. you would make sure there was a ramp. You wouldn't just leave them stuck on the first floor. You'd do something about it. Yeah. Um, then if you had an autistic person that needed to know, need help with transitions, you would say, we're going to have a meeting in 10 minutes. I mean, how hard is that? You know, or you show them how to set the outlook so it pings 20 minutes before the meeting, yeah. so there's no shock. Um, it takes a bit of effort, but isn't it effort that a good leader should expend for anybody? anyway absolutely absolutely and and not only encouraging your team to become self-aware and be better communicators clearer communicators Mm -hmm. but to become self-aware themselves quite often a a leader or a manager will send their team members off to get trained in things when actually they need to be there too they need to be trained in the same way so that you're a cohesive group and now you're you're leading in terms of this is the vision, this is the mission, this is the goal, this is the way we're going, and I will help you to help me get there. Um, Mm -hmm. And and that's the relationship of a leader. Um, I think managers, that's the the older way, if you like, rather than a leader. And Mm -hmm. I, I think I certainly have experienced micromanagement where someone's constantly at me, have you done it yet, have you done it yet, all that sort of stuff. And no one likes that. Nobody likes that. <laughs> and, and, but, you, but I teach people, um, whether you're autistic or not, how to manage upwards. So yes. if, if someone is like that, I would recommend that you say to that person, do you know what? Uh, we have a break time in the morning, break time in the afternoon, and we have lunch time. How about we get together straight after break time and I'll tell you what I've done this morning and what I plan to do before lunch. And it'll also give me a chance to ask you any questions I might have. Then we can meet again after lunch. And do the same thing and then we can meet again after the break in the afternoon and then I'll crack on for the rest of the day how does that suit you chances are that person's gonna bite your hand off because you've come to them and let them know that you want to keep them informed and updated and included etc you're going to be actively doing the task they're asking you to do so they can stop worrying about whether you're doing the task or not mm-hmm. and it's usually because they've had poor experience in the past that they have these behaviors And they feel respected because you're checking in with them and you get that space. You know that that person's now not going to keep coming up to you going, how's it going? How's it going? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I think that's a really good place to end. Before we do that, though, is there anything that I should have asked you or are you really dying to say something (laughs) about? Um, it's, It's the ego. That's the only thing I would like to say is do some work on yourself regardless of what your brain is like Mm. become self-aware work on your ego 
our ego is very fragile and it needs taken care of. So find out how to take care of your ego that doesn't negatively impact other people. Brilliant. I think that's fantastic. Would you come back again, Sam, if we find another topic to talk about? Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Sam as much as I enjoyed having it. If you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the Maverick Paradox, then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders. For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. And finally, if you'd like to work with us or just interested in finding out more about the Maverick at work, check out our website, maverickparadox.co.uk. Mm-hmm.